Well, good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Mishawaka. We're going to begin by singing together, There Is a Fountain. If you please join us in standing together as we sing. Christian fraternity sorority, which was 
men and women on campus, and I had nothing against them, but they, to me they were nerds. They were neither tough nor athletic, and so I didn't have a great image of Christians, but um, on the basketball team, I, as a fresh, I was on varsity as a freshman, there was one other freshman on varsity, and so he and I became good friends, and, and he was Christian. I didn't necessarily pay that much attention to that at the beginning, but the thing was, he was, he was a great player, he was tough, uh, and just a great teammate, nice guy, funny, the whole thing. And it kind of opened in my eyes like, wow, you can actually be Christian and cool. Which is, you know, it's sad that I grew up with this bad image, I think somewhat influenced by my father. That was my experience, uh, and so that there I was, and this guy, and I just one day, I was, it was until my senior year, and I actually, I took a Bible with me to college, and I read it sometimes, but I, I was pretty directionless on it, I would read it, and I think, oh, that's a good lesson, and then uh, I went to my, my friend, he was my best friend at that time, and I went to his dorm just to see him for somebody who was studying the Bible, and I, we started talking, and then he shared the gospel with me, and then I prayed the prayer of salvation, and, that was it. God sent his only son, Jesus, uh, to earth to live and to die for our sins, to save us. It's an outward profession of my faith. I think it's, uh, I, I look at it also as an act of obedience. I'm looking forward to uh, being able to serve more in a greater capacity and just help more people. This morning uh, we have one, uh, Jeff Spies, who has uh, wants to come and proclaim his salvation to you as a church. The desire is to be involved in our church, and so he has... Uh, come and asked if he could be baptized and so this is not a, a uh, anything that saves this water does not save but it does um, show to you uh, what he has come to believe in his heart and so at this time I'm going to have Jeff come and we'll do his baptism Jeff do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again for your salvation on confession of your faith and in obedience to the word of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Slight tidal wave in here, but that's okay. So we thank, thank you for his, uh, his obedience, and I encourage you. Uh, if you have time and uh, opportunity later to just uh, congratulate him on that. Pastor. At this time, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. We're going to receive the morning worship offering this morning. And so as they come, let's bow together in prayer. We give thanks to you, God, for being the Father of love and mercy, who has provided for us all that is necessary for salvation. We thank you for Jeff's faith. We thank you for the declaration of that faith in baptism. And we ask that you would continue to receive glory now, even as we move to a time of our giving, of what you have prospered us with, uh, with our finances. So I pray that uh, we would receive these funds with joyfulness of what you're doing in the hearts of your people, that they would be used according to wisdom and the stewardship that you have given to this church to see the gospel go out in this community and around the world. So we pray now that you be glorified through the giving of your people. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please join us in standing together for a time of worshiping the Lord through our singing. earlier, we will be celebrating together and observing the Lord's Supper a little bit later on in the service. And so for our singing time, we remember what Christ suffered in our place to earn and merit our salvation so that we would not have to merit that salvation, but strictly place our faith in him to receive its benefits. We're going to sing together beginning, see the destined day arise, remembering what Christ suffered on that day. Who was a type of the one who was to come. 
But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're going to sing together a song we began to learn last week that talks about these things. Living Hope. Let's sing together.
few moments now for personal prayer to prepare our hearts for the preaching of the word this morning. Father, this morning we remember the spirit of wickedness that lives in our hearts and that acted in wickedness as we crucified your son, Jesus Christ, the Lord, who deserves all the glory 2,000 years ago. And he was raised up on a tree and died in our place, not because he had sinned, but because he took upon himself the sins of the world. And that through faith in him today, we are absolutely safe and secure because of the righteousness of Christ that is given to us through that faith. And this morning, there's no way we could be safe apart from God's grace, and yet we are, we're secure. And I pray that as we hear from your word this morning, as our pastor preaches your word, as Pastor Will preaches your word, I pray that you would strengthen him, embolden him, allow him to Declare what it is you have worked in his heart this week as he studied your word. And may your spirit use those truths to change us, to help us to see who you want us to be, how you want us to live, how you want us to think and to feel and to love. And I pray that you would help us as we leave this place to bring you all the glory through the way that we live this week. That we might be changed people as a result of our encounter with your word and the truths that are shown to us from it. May we exult only in Jesus and what he has done for us, recognizing we are nothing apart from him, but through him we have everything. So may he receive the glory. Amen. If you would please join us in standing once more before the message, we're going to sing together, Mercy Tree.
may be seated. Children who are normally in junior church will remain in the worship service this morning. Thankful this morning for the privilege of having Pastor Will come up and preach. And uh, it's, it's good for me to sit and, and hear as well sometimes. Take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is uh, the text for this morning. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through verse 24. We'll read uh, that and you follow along as I read. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan of and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it is not possible for him to be held by it. Thank you, Pastor Pete. I appreciate that. I, <clears throat> my wife and I have made the decision to teach our children to not have anything that they are not willing to share with other people. So they very graciously decided to share their illness with me this week. And now my voice is a little bit weak, so please bear with me as <clears throat> I attempt to be able to be understood. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So I'm holding on to that this morning as strong as I can. So would you bow your heads with me as we pray for our message this morning? God, I thank you for how much you love and care for each one of us. God, I pray that as we look into your word right now, Lord, as we dive into it, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be in tune, Lord, with what you would have for us to learn. Lord, I pray that we would be able to focus in on Jesus Christ right now, and that we would be able to learn more about Jesus Christ. I, I thank you for the example, Lord, the testimony that we have of Acts, the wonderful book that we have to learn from. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be, Lord, tender to the moving of your Holy Spirit. What a blessing it is to have the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, let us be humble enough to hear him speak in our lives and be humble enough to change accordingly to how he has us to change. So it's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. We're going to be spending our time this morning looking into the exciting book of Acts. The exciting book of Acts. When the church breaks into the scene of the world, we will spend the majority of our time in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. However, as it is helpful anytime we jump into any book, it's helpful to get a context of what's going on just so we can understand what we're talking about, where it is in the book, and how that can help us understand our text for today. So, if you rewind to chapter 1 of the book of Acts, we can see Jesus speaking with his apostles. He decides to make a promise to them that they would receive the Holy Spirit after Jesus ascends into heaven. This is the very beginning of, of chapter 1 of Acts. Verse 5 says, For John baptized with water, but you will, have baptized, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Then in verse 8, Jesus says, But you will receive power... When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jesus is promising the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell his followers. He's making a promise, a covenant. Now God is a promise keeper. He doesn't change those promises ever. Now if you fast forward to chapter 2, we can see the fulfillment of this promise in a powerful way. So this is how chapter 2 begins with the Holy Spirit indwelling each one of, his, of Jesus' apostles. So this alone is a glorious event, proving once again that Jesus is a truth teller and a promise keeper, unlike many people who claim that Jesus was a liar, which was a large reason of why Jesus himself was crucified by the lawless men like our text talks about. But it proves that he's a truth teller. So the Holy Spirit begins to indwell the apostles. Immediately after... They begin to speak in other tongues in verses 4 through 13 of chapter 2. Now, as some of you are aware, 
portions of Christianity have chosen to uh, take the gift of tongues and given it a twisted meaning to be something that it isn't. Thankfully, we do have very clearly given to us in the book of Acts a <laughs> understanding of how the gift of tongues is to be understood. Verse 5 begins with this. Now, that, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the sound of the gift of tongues being utilized by the apostles, the multitude came together, and they were there bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? The gift of tongues was not a mythical language, unable to be understood. It was actually a different language spoken by another region of the world. A language that the apostles would have never had the opportunity to learn. So it's amazing and awesome how God chose immediately to manifest his Holy Spirit. To spread the message of Jesus Christ across cultures. Even amidst cultural, even amidst language barriers, God chose to use the Holy Spirit immediately to get the message across when it wouldn't have otherwise been possible. That's an awesome reminder for us. However, this gift came with ridicule and mockery. Some even claim that the apostles were filled with new wine. That's another way of saying they were drunk. So people were looking at the apostles, seeing these men speaking gibberish, what they thought was gibberish, uh, which doesn't quite make sense because there were other men and women who understood what they were saying. But they still claim, oh, they're just drunk. Whatever, we can just ignore what they're saying. Nevertheless, Peter, who, if you've done any study of the New Testament at all, you can, you can know that Peter, the apostle, was a very outspoken, not shy in any way person. Okay. So, G, so Peter, seeing this massive crowd of people gathered around, figured this is one, a great opportunity to be able to tell people about, first of all, what's going on with the apostles, that they're not drunk, but also to tell them about why this is all possible through Jesus Christ. So Peter starts in verses 14 through 21, telling everyone that they were not, in, that, in fact, drunk, but actually were fulfilling a prophecy from the book of Joel, chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, it states that God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. So Peter is explaining that the event taking place before them is not a show by any means. Actually, he's waking them up to the fact that they are witnessing history right before their eyes. He's helping them understand that there is a massive fulfillment of prophecy from God happening right before them. It's exciting. So the prophecy in Joel chapter 2 is being fulfilled right before their eyes. And then Peter ends that portion of the text in verse 21 by stating a very comforting phrase for you and I. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then that enters us into our text for today. Acts chapter 2 verses 22 through 24 and I just, I love how Peter sets this up by getting up, explaining that there was an Old Testament prophecy that was being fulfilled right before their eyes. Then it's as if Peter is saying, yes, there was a prophecy being fulfilled, but let me tell you about who made all of this possible. Jesus Christ. And that brings us into verse 22 to 24. But before we do that, there's an overall theme that I would like for us to understand, a concept about this that I'd like for us to understand. That is, the Holy Spirit has come to us by the sacrifice and victory of Jesus Christ. The overall thing, theme of what's going on here is that the Holy Spirit has come to us by the sacrifice and victory of Jesus Christ. In our text today, there are three truths that I think we need to grasp or grab hold of to help us understand why Jesus was vital to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Three truths that we're going to be engaging with, that we're going to be looking at today, are what had to take place in order for the Holy Spirit to come. And it all sur surrounds around Jesus Christ. So the first truth that I would like you to grasp is that one, Jesus' ministry was validated. 
Verse 22 says this, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. Jesus' ministry was validated. Peter begins speaking with the crowd that had gathered and begins talking about Jesus, which was rather a hot topic for the day. If you remember, uh, it wasn't even a couple months previous to this that Jesus had just been crucified. They're in the same town that Jesus was crucified. This was a recent memory of what was going on. Peter's very possibly even talking to some of the same people that crucified and helped to crucify Jesus. It's a hot topic. Some people were for it. Some people were against it. Whatever it might be, there was an, a serious hot topic of what's going on here. Yes, there were many who believed Jesus during his ministry. However, there was a good amount of people who did not believe that Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God. So Peter, as we said before, in his usual blunt manner, uh, goes straight forward into it. He says, Jesus was sent by God and validated through the works God did through him. Notice this how the verse begins in verse 22. It starts with an attention getter. Men of Israel, hear these words. And so he's already been speaking to the crowd for a while. He already has their attention seemingly, but he decides to, uh, once again, make an announcement to just say, everyone needs to stop what they're doing and hear what I'm about to say. This is important. Even after he's already been speaking to them for a little while, so you can tell that the next message he's about to say bears significance. He says that Jesus was attested to you by God. In other words, attested might be a validated or approved with mighty works and wonders and signs. So making the lame to walk, uh, cleansing the lepers of their disease, bringing back Lazarus from the dead. Peter is claiming that each one of these miracles was not just to awe and amaze, like many had assumed that their purpose was. They were to validate that Jesus was sent by God. God didn't just give him permission to be on the earth. God purposefully used Jesus in this way to glorify himself. As the verse continues, it says that all of these signs and wonders God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. God worked through Jesus specifically, not accidentally. There's a commentator whose name is um, John Gill. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He says that Jesus was used as God's instrument. I love, I love the picture that comes along with this. Have you ever seen someone play a guitar, for instance, that is extremely gifted? And I'm not exactly referring to myself or Pastor Nate, because <laughs> uh, while we know how to play the guitar, uh, and Nate, Pastor Nate would agree with me, that when you see someone who is extremely gifted at the guitar, you know it. Because you can't even watch where their fingers are going, you can't even keep track of what's happening, but you see it happening, and you're like, wow, that's amazing, that's incredible, right? Alone, that guitar in and of itself really is worthless when you think about it. I mean, it might look pretty sitting in the corner if you're trying to convince people that you can play when you really can't. It might look cool in a corner. But besides a, a person who actually use and play that instrument, that guitar is worthless in and of itself. But when you put that instrument into the hand of a skilled guitar player, that guitar now has a purpose. It can now make awesome, beautiful music for us to listen to, and even mu music that we can worship with. As John Gill said, Jesus was God's instrument. Now there is a difference because, you know, a guitar in and of itself is, is worthless without a, a, a player for it. Jesus, we know, had worth beyond that. But God validated Jesus' ministry as God's instrument by exactly what this verse says. He worked many wonders and signs through him. This was how God chose to validate Jesus, by working through him, providing him with the abilities that he had, like the ability to heal, to be, to be able to raise people from the dead. 
The Bible provides numerous events to prove that Jesus' ministry was indeed validated by God. So as I said before, there are three truths that I would like you to grasp. The first we just looked at was that Jesus' ministry was validated. The second truth is this. Jesus' death was deliberate. Why was Jesus' death vital? Why was it deliberate? Well, uh, we can think of several reasons. The first one that comes to mind is um, salvation of everyone who would believe in Jesus. It's kind of important for Jesus to, to die in order to take the sins of those who would believe in his name. It's a pretty crucial step in the process. Um, but why did God have to deliberately offer Jesus as a sacrifice for the coming of the Holy Spirit? Because our, our text, like I said, is the Holy Spirit has come by the sacrifice of Christ. But why did Jesus have to deliberately be sent by God to die for the Holy Spirit to come? It's a good question. You can look at it a couple different ways. I choose to look at it this way. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I have decided to run a triathlon. <laughs> Uh, does everyone in here know what a triathlon is? A triathlon is an absolutely insane race. It's crazy. It consists of three different parts. Absolutely insane. You have to be in mad shape in order to run even a portion of one of these races. Listen to this. When you run a triathlon, you swim a distance of 2.4 miles. Already I'm out. <laughs> then you need to get on a bike and bike for 112 miles, still out. Then, on top of that, you get off from your bicycle, and then you run a full marathon. <laughs> uh, this is not true, in case you haven't figured it out. I'm not running a triathlon, it's not happening. Uh, I pr prefer not to die. <laughs> if you're gonna run one of these things, there are steps that need to be taken in order to make this happen. You have to spend, on average, a time of around six to eight months of intense training. Let's say that you begin training for one of these things and you work hard at it. And you put in those, that hard hours of training for six to eight months to get your body, to get your mind ready to take on this race. So imagine with me, it's the day of, it's race day. You wake up, you feel good, you drive to the starting line of the race, you check yourself in, you get ready. Then as the race is about to begin, what you've been working hard for, for six to eight months, you realize that you forgot one crucial step in the process, in the preparation. Then you realize the important step you missed, right as you're about to begin. You forgot your bicycle at home. <laughs> What a lame way to lose a race. <laughs> Forgot your bicycle at home. You see, there are steps that need to take place before you can even consider running one of these triathlons. Nonetheless, on race day, you cannot miss any one of these steps. If you forget your bicycle at home, you lose. There's no way you can catch up. You can't run that fast. It's not going to happen. You will not finish the race. It will be left incomplete. So let's get back to the question, why was Jesus' death Deliberate. Well, just like one who's preparing for a triathlon race, there are appropriate steps that must be taken. In the same way, in order for the Holy Spirit to come to you and I, there were some crucial steps that needed to be taken. What was Jesus doing on the cross as he was being sacrificed? What was he doing there? He was there to pay the penalty of sin. He was there providing for you and I the opportunity to be a part of the family of God. Who does the Holy Spirit indwell? Anyone? The Holy, that's right, the Holy Spirit indwells those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. Those that confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. This is a vital step to the process. We need someone to save us from our sin first before we can ever receive the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? 
If Jesus had not died for our sins, we would not receive the Holy Spirit because we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins, according to Ephesians chapter 2. We would still be stuck, unable to move ourselves out of our sinful condition and into a justified state before God. We would still be dead in our sin and opposed to God. Jesus died to provide a way of salvation from sin, not just from sin, but to God. And I would say that's a pretty vital step in the process, wouldn't you? In verse 23, there's some other things that are interesting for us to consider. Uh, we have verse 22, which talks about how God validated Jesus' ministry through signs and wonders. Then in verse 23, it says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Do I have any uh, language nuts in here? Anybody enjoy the study of language? All right, two of you. Sounds good. Look with me again. It says, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Now, the words definite and foreknowledge are very interesting because the Greek words that these English words come from can be translated in different ways. Uh, it, generally, when you're translating one language into another, you're never going to get an exact definition of what you're meaning. Uh, many of you are familiar with this concept. So, to help us understand a little bit uh, deeper understanding of the words definite and foreknowledge, other words that can be that, that definite can be translated as are words like determined, appointed, or designated. So when you read according to his definite or determinate plan, it can also read according to his determined, appointed, or designated plan. Now nowhere in any of those definitions can you ignore the fact that Jesus' death was deliberate? There was no accident in there. It's not as if God was in heaven and things started going south for Jesus and was surprised that Jesus was crucified. Now, many assume uh, the word foreknowledge, Greek word prognosis, means that God looked ahead in time and saw what was going to happen. Now these people assume that's how God knows the future because he, he looks ahead in time and sees. But the word foreknowledge does not mean that God simply looked ahead and saw the future. Listen to the only two definitions of the word prognosis for foreknowledge. There's only two definitions possible for this, for this word. It can mean either foreknowledge what many of our English translations have. The other word it can mean is previous determination. So we have foreknowledge or previous determination, both meaning the same thing. This means that the phrase, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, means that God previously determined or planned to hand his son over to murderers. Can you imagine that? The words for definite and foreknowledge do not mean that God just looked ahead and saw what was going to happen. No. What verse 23 is saying is that God previously determined or deliberated his son's death. God didn't just know about Jesus dying. He actually planned it. That means that God looked at you, believer, and said, I want you to have my Holy Spirit. But in order for that to happen, there's a step that needs to take place first. I have to hand over my son to murderers. The end of verse 23 states this. This Jesus you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. A lot of this man is generally understood to mean those who did not submit to the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law was generally what Jews would have submitted to at the time, even above Roman Law, but it would have been what the, the Jews submitted to. So the handing them over to the lawless men 
could mean a couple different things. It could mean the Jewish leadership in the town at the time because the Jewish leadership did not ascend through the proper Mosaic law understanding of a trial. They skipped through several steps just to try to murder Jesus. So the lawless men could mean the Jewish leadership, but it could also mean the Roman leadership of the time who acted as Jesus' executioners. Either way, lawless men is referring to men who did not submit to God. <coughs> Either way, there was a clear path that God took in order to deliberately plan Jesus' death. An author by the name of Eckhart Schnabel, quite a sweet name if you ask me, Eckhart Schnabel says it this way, listen closely, this is the paradox of Jesus' death. It was engineered and carried out by human beings while at the same time it was the climax of God's plan of salvation. Jesus' death was no accident. God, the giver of good gifts, wanted for us to have the Holy Spirit, and he knew that the only way that we could ever have his Holy Spirit is, the, is by giving over his son to be brutally beaten and tortured, murdered, and along that process bearing the weight of the sin of every single person who would believe in the name of Jesus Christ. That is heavy. And he had to purposely give over his son for this to happen. We don't deserve this. There is no part in us that is good enough to deserve the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So what does that tell us about God? It tells us that he was willing to sacrifice a lot for us to have his Holy Spirit. Jesus' death was deliberate. Three, tru three truths to grasp. First, Jesus' ministry was validated. Second, Jesus' death was deliberate. And third, Jesus rose victorious. Jesus rose victorious. Verse 24 reads this, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, or conquering death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. I think that sometimes we can get a little bit numb to the topic of the resurrection. Wouldn't you agree? This verse says that God raised Jesus up from the grave because it wasn't possible for Jesus to be held by death. It wasn't possible. This is not something that you hear and just think, oh, okay, that's cool, I guess. Whatever. No, 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 no. This is something that you should God that you should hear, and this should immediately cause you to praise God. Because even though Jesus died, there was no chance he was going to stay dead. He was going to rise from the grave and secure a place for you in heaven. There was no way, there was no chance that Jesus was going to ever be defeated by death. It was impossible. Notice in verse, uh, the first four words in verse 24, God raised him up. It doesn't say that God accidentally raised him up, like, whoops, didn't mean to do that. No, God definitely raised Jesus up. It was a deliberate action. God meant to do this. It refers to what we talked about a moment ago. God did not just know that Jesus was going to rise up from the grave. No, he planned it because he knew that we needed it for our salvation. But not just for our salvation, for the Holy Spirit to enter into our lives. It was a necessary and crucial step along the process. Then the last half of the verse, because it was not possible for him to be held by it, death cannot defeat God. In fact, God just defeated death. Jesus rose victorious. When I think of Jesus' ministry being validated by God, Jesus' deliberate death, and Jesus rising victorious from the grave, I think of three implications that come to mind for us today. Three implications that I would like for us to hold on to as we leave today. First of all, God is a promise keeper. 
God is a promise keeper. It is impossible to look at our passage today and even the verses previous to our passage and not see the connection between the book of Joel and the book of Acts. See, Peter, in his message that he was giving just previous to our text today, he's talking he's about a prophecy given almost 600 years previous. 600 years. That's no joke. 600 years. That's generations. Joel prophesied about the coming of the Holy Spirit 600 years prior to the book of Acts. And even though that was generations past, God still kept his promise. He didn't forget. You and I forget things we heard an hour ago. Could you imagine 600 years? God didn't forget. Even Jesus' words before his ascension into heaven in Acts chapter 1, Jesus states that the Holy Spirit would come. That promise was kept. God is a promise keeper. That should and needs to be a comfort for you is that God promises and he keeps his promises. In the same way that God promised and fulfilled the coming of the Holy Spirit, God promises to you that when you are in the middle of a trial, when you feel like you're just stuck in a rut or not growing or maybe even falling backwards in your faith, Philippians 1, 6, he says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God's a promise keeper. He'll keep that promise. When your past sins creep up on you and they haunt you and they make you want to quit everything you do, when you're tempted to run away, when you're tempted to pull away from people in the church because of some kind of fight or because of some kind of misunderstanding or whatever it might be. When this sin begins to overtake you, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God promises that to you. When you feel empty, weak, or desperate, when you're longing for that one thing, but you just you aren't, God's not giving it to you. God says, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a comfort to know that our God is a promise keeper. Three implications. First, God is a promise keeper. Second, Jesus must be our center. As people were observing the apostles in our text, as they spoke to others in different languages, Peter began speaking to the crowd to provide an explanation of what was happening. Then, Peter wastes absolutely no time by getting to the main thrust, getting to the teeth of his message, which is Jesus Christ. The only reason he was explaining about all of this stuff with the Holy Spirit and what's happening with the apostles and the gift of tongues was so he could get to his main message, Jesus Christ. When you look at the text and how it's laid out, it's almost like a culmination as it's building up to Jesus. This Jesus who you crucified, again, is a tender topic, but he knows it's more important to tell people about the main thing than anything else. It's more important than the fear of him being driven out of town because this Jesus, they were willing to kill anyone associated with him. It's as if Peter is saying, yes, speaking in other tongues is amazing, but you need to hear about why it's amazing. Because it's all about Jesus. Just as Jesus is the center of Peter's message, He must be the center of our lives. And I'm not referring to Jesus being the first above everything in our life. There's a difference. Let me explain. Jesus being above everything in our lives is not the same as Jesus being first in everything in our lives. Let me explain this. A lot of the times the ideas around Jesus being first above everything else 
It means when we come to church and we prioritize Jesus one day a week. And then we go to work and then we make friends and then Jesus kind of falls by the wayside. What Jesus being center of our lives means is that in your friendships, Jesus is first. In your conversations, Jesus is first. In your work life, no matter how difficult it might be, Jesus has to be first. It means in your marriage, Jesus has to be first. In every single aspect of your life, Jesus needs to be the top priority. How can I glorify Jesus even more through how I eat this food? How can I glorify Jesus even more by how I talk to my unbelieving neighbor? Jesus must be the center of our lives, not just an add-on. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture epitomizes Jesus being the center and focus of our lives. Galatians 2.20, many of you probably know it. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus must be our center, just as Galatians 2.20 says. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer will living inside of me. It's now Jesus Christ. It's as if Jesus Christ is being friends with every one of my friends, and I need to begin revealing Jesus Christ in any way I can to everyone I know in the job I have, the experiences I have, whatever it might be. Jesus must be our center. The third implication for us, the Holy Spirit enables us to keep Jesus as our center. Just as God promised through the work of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit now indwells followers of Jesus Christ, made possible through the sacrifice of Christ. One of the main ways that the Holy Spirit enables us to keep Jesus as our center is by guiding us to truth, to the Word of God. John 16, 13 says this, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit acts as a guiding agent in our lives that guides us to the truth of God's word. God's word, in case you don't know, is filled with stories about Jesus. It's going to help us understand aspects of how we're to live our life like Jesus Christ and how we're supposed to conform our lives to the image of Jesus Christ. On top of having the spirit of truth, we have the spirit to guide us to interpret and understand the word of God, which again, in turn, helps us keep Jesus as our center. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13 says, Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to keep Jesus by our center, at our center by driving us back to God's word. That is why the Holy Spirit is so important in our lives. It helps us remember what is important. Church, let me encourage you to remember from Acts 2, 22 to 24, that God is a promise keeper. That what he has promised to you, he will keep, without question. That Jesus must be our center, and that the Holy Spirit enables us to keep Jesus as our center. Hold on to these truths from our text today. Let's pray and praise God for the work of Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for the gift that we have, Lord, of being a part of your family. God, I thank you for the privilege of having the Holy Spirit in our lives. God, I know that uh, it is not something that we deserve. It is not something that we have earned, but yet it's a gift that we've been given. So, Lord, I thank you for providing us the opportunity to be your family and providing us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's the name of Jesus Christ I pray.
Amen. Would you please join us in standing together glorious truths that we have to recite in song. Let's sing together, Complete in Thee. God, we are thankful for what Jesus Christ has done for us. As we heard in our message this morning, it brings, it brings so many things into our lives, benefits, blessings. Lord, there's also a, a desire and a responsibility that we have to then place Jesus as first and foremost and center of our life. Lord, I just pray that you will, at this time, help us to focus our minds just for this time to remember what Jesus did, Lord, to, to, to be thankful for the work of Christ on the cross. And we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. This time we're going to ask the deacons to stand and we'll distribute the cup.
drink in remembrance of Christ. God, we are thankful that we can be here today. We're thankful for the work that Christ did on the cross for us. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us now as we leave here, that our lives will be different, that the way we speak, the way we interact with others, everything that we do will be different because of Christ is in our life. And Lord, we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, the deacons are going to stand and they're going to come around and collect your cups and then Pastor Nate will conclude the service. this week that you might embolden us to fulfill your commission, to show your love to those who have not yet known you. I pray for those who are absent from our midst this morning. I know there are many who are ill, unable to be here for whatever reason. Think specifically of uh, Steve and Alice Mortensen who are ill this morning, others who have told me that they were unable to be here. May your grace be strong in their lives this morning. I pray that their time in your word would be precious and soul-encouraging and life-giving. And I pray that we all would be driven to your word this week, that we might receive the sustenance that we need to serve you, to be changed into your image. May you be glorified in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey there, First Baptist. Let's talk about what's going on at our church. This afternoon, our Primrose Church Service will be meeting at 2.30 p.m. at Primrose Retirement Community. I know it says 2 o'clock in our bulletins, but it's actually at 2.30 p.m. So if you're planning to attend, please meet at Primrose just before 2.30. At 5.30 p.m., the Awana Grand Prix will be held in the gym. Tonight, we will be participating in Operation Christmas Child. We'll be packing shoeboxes full of gifts for children around the world. Please bring small gifts to pack for a boy or a girl. Every box should include one wow item. Great wow items include stuffed animals, dolls, shoes, or small musical instruments. Other great gifts include toy cars, jump ropes, school supplies, hair clips, yo-yos, sunglasses, and hats. Please don't bring candy, gum, used or damaged items, 
water-related items, foods, liquids, lotions, or stuff like that. It costs $9 to ship one of these shoe boxes to a child. If you can help contribute to shipping costs, please write your check to our church, First Baptist Church, and then designate it for Operation Christmas Child. If you can't afford to give towards shipping costs, you can still help us pack the shoe boxes. Last year, we packed 50 shoe boxes, and this year, we want to double that amount and pack 100 shoe boxes with gifts in the gospel. I want to encourage you to come on out tonight and enjoy serving with your brothers and sisters in Christ as we have this great opportunity to give the gospel out to children all around the world. Today is the last day to sign up for a photo session for our new church directory. Photo sessions are this week, so go ahead and head right out over to the Annex table and sign up for your photo session if you haven't already. This Wednesday is the monthly men's breakfast. Men, you are welcome to meet at Allie's Cafe at 8.30 a.m. Friday at 6 p.m. is the monthly Young at Heart game night downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. In a couple of weeks, on Saturday, November 16th, our church will be hosting an ordination council to examine Pastor Will concerning his doctrine and his call to ministry. If the council recommends him for ordination, we will do that the following day during the worship service. You are welcome to attend the ordination council's questioning here at the church on Saturday, November 16th at 1 p.m. This can last for a few hours, so you're welcome to attend for any part or all of the time. We will have a celebratory meal following the worship service on the 17th, and if you're planning on attending that meal, please sign up in the Annex on your way out today. Finally, if you're new here at First Baptist, we'd love to get to know you more. If you stop by our guest center in the Annex, we have a gift for you as our way of saying thanks for worshiping with us. Have a great week, First Baptist.